In the 1970s, during the era of Brezhnev's stagnation in the USSR, Dnipropetrovsk, the birthplace of the General Secretary, experienced a period of rapid development. The Southern Machine Building Plant was actively engaged in the space industry. The facility was classified as a highly secretive location, even driving a taxi near it was prohibited. Hence, no one could have imagined that rapes and murders would occur in the vicinity of such a heavily guarded production site. By the end of 1969, rumors spread about a serial killer operating in the city. In the vicinity of UMC and the neighboring residential areas, an unidentified man was attacking women during the evenings and nights. He would ambush them from behind, using a lanyard to strangle and rape them. If the victim regained consciousness, he would kill her. The assailant would take small personal items from the unconscious victims as mementos. Those who regained consciousness couldn't provide a description of the attacker since they had not seen him. The police attempted to conceal this information, but it leaked out, spreading through word of mouth, and panic swept through the city like a snowball. It was evident, a serial killer was on the loose, recalled Ivan Gladush, a police investigator during the 1970s. Dnipropetrovsk was awash with alarming rumors. Women were afraid to walk alone in the evenings, and parents refrained from letting their daughters go out. The factory even canceled night shifts for women. Those returning home late were welcomed. Due to the numerous crimes, Moscow swiftly became aware of the situation in this forge of political cadres. High-ranking officials were dispatched to investigate, and around 3,000 police officers were involved in the hunt for the killer. All suspicious locations where the criminal might hide were inspected. Attics, basements, and summer houses. Volunteer Druzhiniki squads patrolled the streets, working alongside the police. To catch the perpetrator, undercover operations were employed. Officers dressed as women, traversing dimly lit alleys, loitering near the factory, and even setting up surveillance points in trees. However, the assailant seemed to anticipate their plans and never revealed himself during the ambushes. Yet, as soon as the operation concluded, the same night the maniac would strike again. Once more, there was no trace, not even the faintest clue hinting at the identity of the culprit. Law enforcement officers were at a loss, the night demon, there was no other way to describe it. At the time, they could not fathom that the murderer was privy to the police's schemes and trap locations. Moreover, he actively participated in the search for himself. One of his victims survived, continued Ivan Dmitrievich. Near the Metallurgical Institute, there was a dormitory for low-income families, where a young couple resided. Vadim, an engineer at the Metallurgical Institute, and his wife Lena, on maternity leave with a six-month-old daughter. One day, in broad daylight while Vadim was at work, a stranger barged into the room. Caught off guard by the sudden intrusion, the young woman couldn't even call for help. The maniac attacked her choking her until Lena lost consciousness. After raping the unconscious woman, he was about to leave when the child started crying. The sound of the baby's cries roused Lena, allowing her to catch a glimpse of the criminal. She couldn't provide a sketch, but she vowed that she would recognize her assailant if she ever saw him. Desperate to apprehend the perpetrator, the police began taking Elena on public transportation in hopes that he would reveal himself sooner or later. And it eventually worked. For an entire month, Elena and the criminal investigator Anatoly Tokar embarked on fruitless journeys. But finally, on one of the trams, the woman identified her rapist. Suppressing her emotions, she signaled the police officer. However, the culprit recognized his victim as well. Without waiting for the tram to stop, he forced open the door, leaped out, and fled. Now, all hope rested on Tokar. A sketch of the killer was created based on his descriptions. The profiles were distributed to all officers, and checkpoints were established, including at Yuzhmash's entrances. If the victim regained consciousness, Berlizov would strangle her. Soon, a lead emerged. A similar-looking young man was employed at a classified enterprise. Suspicions fell not on a machine operator or a mechanic, but on Alexander Berlizov, the secretary of the factory's Komsomol committee. A young and robust individual, a dedicated Komsomol member, and remarkably, a voluntary vigilante actively involved in the manhunt. Berlizov attended all joint meetings of law enforcement and vigilante groups, aware of when and where to locate the criminal. 
it wasn't surprising that he had gone unnoticed for so long. I remember that dreadful period well. My husband worked at Yuzhmash as the head of the plant squad, shared Maria Tereschenko with KP in Ukraine. When he returned from work, he recounted everything in detail. During that time, we lived near Yums, and I distinctly recall discovering a raped girl in the nearby yards. He mentioned Sasha, born in 1946, and how active and positive he was. We would have never thought he was capable of such a heinous act. Maria Ivanovna also recalled how the killer was identified through his shoes. At the scene of the last attack, which took place in a forest near the plant during the snowy season, numerous footprints were present. It was determined that these were imprints of imported boots, a rare commodity at the time. Only a few could afford to purchase them. All show stores were scrutinized, revealing that the imported boots had been distributed in limited quantities. Eventually, foreign footwear was linked to Berlizov. The puzzle pieces were falling into place, and it seemed feasible to apprehend the criminal. However, it wasn't that simple. At the time, Komsomol and party leaders were considered untouchable figures. How could a respected individual from the office possibly be a murderer? It seemed preposterous. We requested authorization from regional prosecutor Volkov to apprehend him. However, he vehemently declined, citing that the police were acting oddly and a respected Komsomol leader was being falsely accused of a serious crime, said Ivan Gladush. Nevertheless, the investigation persisted. A book from the scene of the last crime was discovered under Berlizov's mattress in his dormitory room. There were no more doubts, even though Sasha himself smiled and insisted we were mistaken. Operatives promptly flew to Berlizov's parents' residence in Stavropol. In their home, a bundle containing souvenirs, stolen from the victims, mirrors, combs, and more, was discovered in a closet. The evidence was irrefutable. Gladish recalled that during questioning, Alexander confessed to everything, shedding tears and pleading for forgiveness. The serial killer who had terrorized Dnipropetrovsk for over two years was deemed sane by expert examination although identified as a sexual psychopath. Berlizov thus became the USSR's first officially recognized serial killer. For committing 42 rapes and nine murders, Berlizov received the death penalty, execution by firing squad. The sentence was carried out in the Dnepropetrovsk Detention Center in 1972. Evidently, due to the potential spread of these crimes across the country and the involvement of a Yuzhmash employee, the case files and photographs have vanished from the archives of Dnipro's law enforcement agencies. It's possible that they were sent to Moscow or even destroyed. The night demon left no tangible traces, only haunting memories that continue to linger even after nearly half a century.